a lot of transition, you know, and, and that's part of it. And I think uh, we're going to just kind of see and learn. Change is something that is inevitable every day of our lives. And if you know me at all, every weekend, something a little different, some kind of a tweak. I want you showing up excited for church services, wondering what will be different this week? What cool story or what little change is going to happen? That's just who I am at my very core, and it will always challenge you to stay flexible and fluid. Uh, Michael Cronin this morning led for us in worship. He drove over the last two days from Sacramento. He's driving all over the country using his gift that God has given him to share with churches and other gigs kind of thing. And so uh, when he showed up, I was excited he was here this morning. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I don't see you, but maybe you're in here. He's going to actually be leading us in worship the next three weeks. And, and so looking for some consistency there. All right, stand with me. We're going to do our next teaching and command of Jesus. Very simple message today. Here's what Jesus says. Anyone who listens to my teaching, Jesus says, and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house. It won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. Sorry, thank you, Karen, for advancing that. I hit it. It's going to move it forward. Go back one. <laughs> it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And when Jesus, it continues, had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority. And then Matthew throws in a little jab, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the next few moments that we have, help us understand that you, you are the king of all rock. You absolutely are solid, unchanging, the very same yesterday, today, and forever. And may we think of one or two things, God, in the time that we have remaining that will help us concrete our feet, cling to you as our rock. So as we go out into the world and face the joys and the triumphs, the challenges, the tragedies, we will not embarrass you. We will hold our ground for you and represent you so very well. We love you. We thank you. And all glory and honor to you today, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Listen real quick to uh, the message version of that passage. I looked it up. It cracked me up. I, I wouldn't study the Message Bible as a study, study tool, but it's fun to read it and get a different perspective in regards to the scripture that I just read. Listen to what the message version reads in regards to the passage we just stood and read. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. And when a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. And when Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying. I love that sentence. It was apparent that he was living everything that he was saying. Quite a, uh, quite a contrast to the religious leaders. This was the best teaching they'd ever heard. It's a cool version, the message version. And so I want to talk about, just in regards to this word obey, true or false, think about this. I can pull out my pen and circle. I'm not going to do it today. True or false, 
in Jesus' culture, his Jewish Hebrew culture, does the word obey actually exist in its language? Think on that for a minute. In Jesus' Hebrew culture, in the language of the people, does the word obey even exist? The answer is true. There is no actual word obey in the Hebrew culture. Think on that. Fascinating. So listen to these passages. Here's where translators today translate it to obey in our Bibles. Hear, O Israel. That's the word, hear. The Hebrew word is shema is what it is. I I pulled up. Let me read something here for you just out of a, uh, pulled this straight off of a Jewish website. The word obey, uh, simply, it it doesn't exist. Uh, Let me just read it. The word means hear or listen, shema. It's an excellent example between the difference of Hebrew, Hebrew language, Old Testament, which stresses physical action. And Greek, the New Testament is written in Greek, not because God just demanded it had to be written in Greek. It happened to be the language of the culture at the time. And it's a dangerous language when it comes to biblical understanding. I went through Bible college, had my master's degree, had to go through major Greek understanding. And as I've matured and grown and learned over the last 27 years of full-time ministry, Greek is very dangerous to the mentality of what Jesus is trying to teach us. The best way to understand Scripture is to understand the Hebrew culture. And I've said in here before, sometimes the best way to begin reading and understanding the Bible is understand what the cultures were going through back in Jesus' time frame, around 50 A.D., Do some cultural studies of what was going on in Ephesus, in in Galatia, in Philippi, in Colossus, in Corinth, where we have the Scriptures written, and you'll see these authors of the Scriptures, God directing and guiding them how to answer questions these churches were asked. And these letters have been preserved, and we use them as a guidance to understand who is Jesus, how does He expect us to live in our culture today? And you'll just see over the long haul, there's no word obey. It's simply here. Let me finish reading this. Hebrew word, though, stresses action. Greek, I didn't finish the sentence, and the Western culture, which is Greek-influenced, stresses mental activity. And so we've got our education and academia systems that say it's all got to be up here in our brains and it's mental activity. Think better, sound smarter, be academic. And you never see Jesus actually teach that way. You'll see him actually criticize. You'll see Paul write in Romans and 1 Corinthians and passages about how God will never use the wisdom of the world to show his ways. That God will use the foolishness of his ways in order to reach people. And that's his way of shaming the wise, the academic. It's fascinating what we've done. I don't know about you, but I'm really thinking about it in in the sense of I have kids going into college, and I'm sometimes wondering, what is the point? By the time they get through college, we pay, what, $100,000 so they can have a certificate that says, you're just like everybody else. We approve you. Well, who approves? And we have an education system in our culture today that's based out of the 1500s. In an era today where kids have the ability to pull up all the information they could ever find answers on in seconds, and we still have an old education system, and if we're not careful in our churches and our culture, we'll be thinking it's all about this. But Jesus' culture was all about action. Let me finish reading this Jewish statement. He says this, as a Jewish rabbi, listening in our culture, the Hebrew culture, is a mental activity. And hearing just means that our ears pick up sounds. But in Hebrew, the word Shema describes hearing, and it includes its effects, taking heed, being obedient, doing what is asked. Any parent who yells at their children, were you listening? When they ignore a command to pick up their rooms, they understand that listening should result in action. In fact, almost every place we see the word obey in the Bible It's translated from the word hear. So listen to some Bible passages now. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, typo, and with all your might. Another typo. Oh my gosh, I didn't proofread this. Forgive me. Good enough principle. Obey, O Israel. So anytime you see the word here in the scriptures, listen to this. Jesus frequently said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You want to go, what is wrong with Jesus? What is he saying here? He who has ears to hear, obey. He who has ears to obey, obey is how it should actually read. Listen to James 1.22. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Back to the last paragraph of this Jewish article. The word Shema, hear, to hear, it's, it's the name of the, of the Jewish Pledge of Allegiance. That's how we could best understand it. Jesus and other observant Jews up until this day have said every morning and every evening, it's the first word of the first line, hear, Shema, O Israel, the Lord is our God the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. They start every day with that phrase, and they end every day with that phrase. It's kind of cool to think of that. A reminder to stay loyal and obedient to the Almighty, to the Word of God. So I want to talk about just briefly, this is simple stuff, and literally we're going to be done early today. This is unheard of. Here's some ideas. Oh, I say that, but you know me. I get it. I, as I look at my notes in front of me, we should be done shortly. Ideas to persevere, and I want you to think about it. If Jesus is the rock, we're called to cling to Him. And, and sometimes you're going you're gonna to see in the way I'm preaching through the teachings and the commands of Jesus, it's so vitally important to try with everything you can to be here each weekend because they build. I'm taking Jesus' sermons in the Scriptures, His teachings, and we're breaking them down to one segment of teaching at a time. But the way Jesus taught, he tied them in. So it's very important that you try to, man, church attendance, try to. If you cannot make it, we have the live stream going again. That people across the country, around the world, I'm communicating with Sam, our, our, our director in Uganda, uh, to be able to tune in online and, and watch it live. It's all done through Facebook now, Facebook Live. In fact, the pictures, the slides, the verses, they'll all be on there from this point forward. Cole Pace has stepped in on the staff and is doing a great job getting us rolling in that aspect. So, if you miss it, you can still catch it. But I just want to encourage you, come to church each weekend. So, here's some ideas to persevere on, to cling to the rock. Number one, listen to this. As you think about Jesus, you've got to start asking yourself, and you can relate this to the secular world of anything you want to accomplish. Simply this, know what you want. What is it you want today? Why are you here? What is it you're trying to be in your life? Have you set a goal? If it's just here, and even when you just verbalize it, it's just a dream. It's an idea. But until you take it and you put it in writing, the importance, you'll hear me until I drive you crazy, I probably already am. To get a life journal, they're free, they're out at Big Blue, the Welcome Center. Page six are the instructions. And even if you don't follow the instructions, you're journaling out your thoughts, your ideas, your dreams. So you have a goal in front of you. So now you know you can measure it. Have I achieved it? And even if you get 10 pages, 15 pages, or three journals into it, and you still haven't started your goal... It's every day is a fresh day. Each day is a new start. So what is your goal in this morning specifically when it comes to your spiritual life? What is your ultimate goal? And only you can decide that under the witness of God with you who lives inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus. Plot a course of action with that goal. You have a goal and you start taking and writing out some steps because if it's just a goal, there's still nothing happening. That's just Greek. You've written it down and it's intellectual. It's of the mind. But until you say, I'm going to begin taking a step of faith. And what is faith, by the way? Look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. 
So many people think faith and being a follower of Jesus is just this blind faith. No, it's not a blind faith at all. Faith is about understanding and doing the study. Where in the heck did his body go? After it was guarded by this incredible Roman guard and after basically Caesar, Pontius Pilate, puts a, puts a seal on it saying that body may not be disturbed and it disappears. See, faith is reality. Faith is evidence. So it's not faith to just open your Bible and read it and store it here. Faith is evidence. Faith is reality. Action is when I and the Lord and people around you begin to say, that is a person of faith. And I think some of the stereotype that's happened in our culture and in American society that's so anti-Christian, it has to do a lot with this, but not a lot of action. It's a lot of talk and not a lot of action. The more and more people who I encounter, whether it be just simply talking to people on Facebook or people out in society, sitting around city meetings where I go jump in on some city meetings on occasion, I hear people who are so disturbed by Christianity. But when I get to the nitty-gritty and I start asking them questions of why, it narrows down to simply they've been deeply hurt by somebody who called themselves a follower of Jesus but lived a very hypocritical life. Over and over and over. It is a consistent pattern in our society. And you and I, I personally have set a goal. And I, don't, I pray I don't ever have to do it single-handedly. Could we as Christ church begin to be a witness to our community and the world of what it means to truly be a fully devoted follower of Jesus? So when it comes to faith, at least walk. Here's something that maybe, maybe you know, maybe you don't. In the Hebrew culture, remember Jesus said, he said some weird things. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He said, the first will what? Shall be last, and the last shall be first. And if you study Hebrew culture at all, you'll see that in lists that are listed through the Scripture, that the most important one is the last one. See, if my wife gives me a honey-do list or I need to run to Safeway or Fry's or don't want to start that debate around here with you all, <laughs> wherever you shop, I, I'll stop there, she'll put most important first. The other honeys in the room, do you do the same for your honey? You, you put the most important at the top of the list. That's the American system. We are number one. That's what we want to be at the top. But Jesus actually says the last shall be first. And so when you see this phrase, this scripture passage out of Isaiah, but those, we have a list here. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high like on wings of eagles. Who doesn't want to do that? I love a mountaintop experience. I love that I get to go with 30 of our youth to Christ and Youth Conference to Biola University in California, leaving tomorrow. And we're going to go experience a mountaintop experience. There will be 2,000 some students rocking out. I'm going to feel old, I promise you. I might start saying things like, those drums are too loud, <laughs> right? It's a mountaintop experience. Who doesn't want that? But it's not the most important on the list. And you keep reading, they will soar like on wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary. Jesus is saying, yeah, that's good. That's getting a little better. You're getting warmer. But the most important thing as a fully devoted follower of Jesus, according to Isaiah, is they will walk and not faint. Do you hear the strain with that? The older I get, the more I realize nothing comes easy. Zero. Anything good in your life, it does not come easy. It requires us to put a goal, write it down, set up a plan, and every day for the rest of our lives, go for it. Work hard at it. Sweat it out. That's where the true character is built. That's where the true journey is lived. And they tell stories about many times those who climb Mount Everest, they get to the peak and they get to the top and they get up there and then they come down. You would think it'd be mountaintop. They go through massive depressions. It's not the achievement of the goal. How many times do we hear this? That really fulfills and satisfies. It's the journey and the pursuit of the goal. It's the stirring, the changing, the, the getting out of our comfort zones that reminds you you're alive. And me too. It's not the achievement of the goal where we most feel alive. It's the walking and not fainting, the perseverance. The Bible talks about long-suffering. That's where God is best glorified. 
and being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, you never achieve until the day you meet Jesus. And you cannot and I cannot let down our guard for even a moment. For it is every day and the devil is patient. He's waiting for you to let down your guard. And the instant you let it down, he's got you, but he'll do it carefully. He won't alert you. He won't alarm you. He'll just lull you to sleep. And he's patient. He's been around from the beginning. And so let's keep thinking through this. So you set a goal. Look at number two. You got to rise. You got to rid, rise above self-doubt, rid of self-doubt. And the way you do that is you, you recognize. So you have a goal. You kind of work your process to it. You're going to have self-doubt along the way. Those of you who are here, I think when I first, one of the, about a year ago, we did the six phases of faith. Everything starts with the dream, you make a decision, you face delays, difficulties, dead ends, and depending on how you push through the dead end, you're either delivered or you're, you're I forget the other D word, destroyed. And the instant you let down your guard, you get destroyed. You push through, walk and not faint. God delivers through the hard times. But through that whole process, you will have self-doubts. I wrote a blog out just recently about my experience of transitioning from a founding lead pastor. It is the most difficult thing I've ever done in 27 years of ministry. I mean that. That is not me being dramatic. There are so many times this past year I have thought, I do not have a clue what I'm doing. This, I'm making a mess of things. But I feel for the first time God has us. Of course, where I am and who I know God has gifted me to be is a church planter. And I know how to take something, and it's just, it's just a gift God gives me to, to work and to persevere through those tough times and to build. And I feel like we have been stripped down, and now we're ready to build. And it is a principle that people don't like. I can't imagine your rose bush when you're out there with your clippers and you're trimming off what's sometimes even healthy fruit. I just trimmed a tree in my backyard, took it to the Salt River dump. Is that what it's called? Salt River, whatever, the... the 1,100 pounds of tree. Yeah, how smart was I to do it when it was 112 degrees? But I imagine if that tree could talk, oh, it was upset. It was upset. And I'm sitting there going, I've been doing this all year. Get used to it, tree. And I don't say that with any joy. Pruning to me is not fun. But we are at a point to build now. We're ready. We face the challenges. We've seen the change. We've seen what is coming. You've heard the vision. This church has been remarkable in 33 years. To step up and achieve and to pay off debt, most churches never do that their entire life. But to do what? To say, we've arrived? To this point and no further? Or do we say, life is short, let's continue to climb Everest? and move forward. And so, rid of self-doubt. And the only way you do that is you have to know that Jesus defines you. I can only speak personally over the last year. I've had some great encouragement, but I've had incredible criticism. And in that criticism, I've had to pause and go, okay, Lord, who, who do you say that I am? Are you sure this is a gift that you've given me? Are you positive this is a strength? Because the temptation to cut and run has been huge. Do you ever have self-doubts in the pursuit of something difficult? The only way you counter it is to say, Jesus is the one who defines me. He died for me in my place. He calls me His masterpiece, His prized possession, and you too. And that is my definition. And any time I encounter a message opposite or even a little tweaked than that, I have to go back to the Creator and be defined by Him. Rise above self-doubt. Number three, rise above haters. And by haters, I simply mean the two biggest haters in the world are circumstances, number one. The circumstances you face in life will hate you. And they'll make you hate yourself. You, nothing comes easy and you're going to step out and you set a goal and you write down and you chart a path and you begin to pursue it and you just, the hammer comes out. And the circumstances of life just, you feel like you're hated. And then you have critics and I've determined critics don't hate you. Critics are just being, they're just sharing their opinion about something they don't like and it's okay. 
But you can't give too much voice to circumstances and to critics. You listen for but a moment. I love the story of King David. I said we were getting out of here early. Ain't happening. (laughs) There's a story of King David, and I can't remember the guy's name. But David's son is, uh, is taken over the kingdom, and David has to tuck tail and run town, run out of town. King David, greatest warrior. And on his way out of town, there's this, this guy in the ditch, and he's throwing rocks at King David, and he's calling him all kinds of foul names. And David's sword bearer, bodyguard, walks up to David and says, would you like me to remove his head? How would you respond to that after rocks are pelting you in the side? And you are King David, by the way, right? And David says, no, let him continue, for maybe the Lord is trying to tell me something through him. That's a beautiful phrase of humility from King David. So give ear to the critic for one but short second and ask, Lord, are you trying to tell me something here? And I find it fascinating, that's where we think the story ends, but then as Solomon gets ready to take King David's laying on his deathbed, this story just makes me chuckle. King David is human, just like you and me. He's laying on his deathbed, and and I forget the context of the whole line and all the lines going in, but this is how I translate it. Solomon is like, hey, Dad, I know you're about to go. Is there anything final I can do for you? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Son, by the way, before I die, you remember so-and-so who threw those rocks and cursed at me as I was walking out of town? Remember that? I told you that story? Make sure he dies a bloody death. (laughs) And I'm like, what? King David, you evil man. It's just a fascinating story. So anyway, I can't help. Rise above. Rise above the critics. Rise above your circumstances. Haters is a strong word for that, but it grabs our attention. Rise above it. Number four. Know your values. Have you ever written down your values? I've taken just for us as Christ Church the word Christ and created some core values of every decision we make as a team, as a staff, and should be every one of us in our life groups and and as we are the church. They they should be this, this acronym. C is commitment to excellence. H is a heart for evangelism. R, in an old one I used to do, used to say relationships. But I personally feel like amongst us, it should be risk. What are we doing to risk for the Lord as Christ Church of Fountain Hills? That's the R. I is integrity. S is maintain a servant mentality. And T is where the relationship gets filled in. Teamwork is where things are best achieved. Christ. Those are our core values. And as a staff, we have to make decisions on that. It's, it's that letter C that really motivates me a lot, a commitment to excellence. That's why it drives me crazy. We don't have the snow fixed yet on that. I mentioned it last week as accountability. That's not excellence, but what we found out is the projector's going bad. So that's another purchase we're going to have to do, and I don't know who wants to break their neck and go up there and try to change it out, but we're going to work on that. So I state that because it bothers me that that's not excellent just a little thing. And a lot of us are like, oh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, but we love each other. But when a new person comes in, they notice the snow. And they go, snow doesn't belong in Phoenix. What's that? that? Anyway. anyway. (laughs) Do you know your values? What are your personal values? If you don't have them written down, you don't have them here, then you'll go out into the world. And it's kind of like what I'll tell a high schooler. Listen, you're going on a date tonight. Have you drawn a line in the sand about how far you're going to go or not go sexually? Because if you're waiting till the last minute when the, when the cheeks are flushed and the heart's beating a little bit faster and all that good-looking person's just right there in the zone, it's very difficult to create values on that spot. That's a dangerous place to be. It's called pregnant C. Right? Don't wait till the last minute. What are your values? Number five, face or admit your current reality. I've said this over the last few weeks. The truth hurts. It does not harm us. It hurts. You cannot believe a bad reality away. Just believe and you shall achieve. Can I get an amen? I really struggle with prosperity preachers. It's really difficult. My wife and I have this conversation a lot where something's going really good in our life and, and many or so, somebody has something really going well in their life. 
and there's just not a strong self-awareness about how people perceive what we say, and people will say, I'm just so blessed that this happened to me. Well, true, I, I understand that, but, but if it didn't happen to you, aren't you still blessed? And so I, I'm really technical kind of that way. Be careful when we say we're blessed. I was so blessed to have a child, you tell the story, and you're telling it to a woman who lost her child a month ago, and you're just not even thinking about it. it, it I'm just making up a story. It, you're blessed and she's not. So think through our words are so... Look at your whole life situation. Where are you at? What is your current reality? Are you stuck at all? Admit it. Write it down and push through. You can't have an escapism mentality. You can't just believe it'll go away. You can't just study the Bible and it's just going to go away. And I've kind of determined where God knows that you can make the changes in your life. I find that He doesn't need to miraculously come in and just change you. He's waiting on you to get up and move forward. You'll pray and pray and pray. It's the story of Moses as he's leading the entire group of Israelites out of Egypt. And they arrive at the Red Sea. This location is called Baal Zephon. There's a mountain range here and a mountain range there. There's a million plus Israelites trying to, to go to the promised land. And there's this body of water. And behind them, the Egyptians are coming to kill them. Baal Zephon literally is translated in English, God's cul-de-sac. It's fascinating. And when you're at this cul-de-sac, it's a cool story. Moses falls on his face and he's praying, Lord, help us. I don't know what to do. You know what God's reply is? Moses, why are you praying to me? Get up and do what I told you to do. God said to Moses, stop praying to me. You know what you need to do. Moses was struggling. He had the goal written down. He was starting to have some self-doubt. And Moses gets up. And he holds the staff. He takes a step of action into the water. Oh, this crazy moment. Crazy. I hope that's on DVD someday. I want to see it in truth. Face or admit your current reality. No escapism. Number six, you need to join a life group. You're going to hear me all the time. It's a hot topic right now. There's some women's ministry things happening around Christ Church of Fountain Hills. I love that. I think that's exciting. And there's multiple movements happening amongst women's ministry things. And I get asked frequently, will you please support from the front this or this ministry or that ministry? And I'm clearly, no, I won't. Because nothing comes easy. And if you can't build something without the staff support, it probably shouldn't exist. If God's behind it, He's going to help it grow and attract the kind of people to accomplish the goal you want. And the reality is this, I want us to have a very narrow focus as a church. We attend church together and we go to life groups together, but in groups scattered. Because in an American society today, we only have so much time and commitments on our hands. And so now, if we're not careful, the church thinks it's being fruitful through busyness. And the reality is that's not necessarily fruitful. You get up every day and on this day I've got my Bible study here and on this day I go to my life group and then on this day I go to church and then over here my kids got to go to youth group and the next thing you know you're about six months into it and you're thinking divorce, you're never talking together as a married couple anymore, you're, hard, you're running crazy and wild and you got so many things going on you can't even keep up. And God says be still and know that I'm God. So it's better to be really good at a few things and it's always a challenge trying to sort out. And I will always say this, that listen, if you, if you believe there should be an additional ministry going on at Christ Church of Fountain Hills, who are you waiting on to get it started? You don't have to go through staff approval. Go get it started. Gather a group and be so successful in it. We look and I'm like, holy cow, I got to pay you to join on our staff. Look at the fruit that you are producing. Who are you waiting on? If it takes the stage to help you be successful in an endeavor, you're probably not ever going to be successful in it. And so let that motivate you, anger you, challenge you to step out and go build something. And you'll see if by the fruit we'll know if it's something that God was behind. Fair enough? Join a life group. Number seven, acknowledge it will be an adventure you must live every day. I'm not going to read the whole passage because I'm over time. I do want to read a poem. Uh, I will say about Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, it tells us to get up every day and put on the full armor of God. 
because the devil is just looking to attack you. And it's what I've been trying to say. Don't let down your guard. Do not let down your guard on this spiritual thing. It's the little details. Be faithful with the small. Be working on them every day and be diligent in it because nothing matters more than what we're experiencing right now. A holy challenge to rise and become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Anything else in world in the perspective of a biblical worldview that's more important than what we're experiencing right now? This is where your family becomes its best. This is where you become a better worker, boss, employer, whatever you are job-wise. This is where you are sharpened, holy. And when it's all said and done and Jesus returns, nothing else matters. And so I want to end with the story of a limpet. You know what a limpet is? That's one. Anybody watching the TV show Alone where they have to eat these things? Robert Service is one of my favorite poets. Don't tell the guys I like poetry. I'm going to read this. It's a little long, but get in the rhythm. Hear this. This makes sense. And then Michael, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut the last song. We're just way too long. My fault. Unless you guys want to sing the last song. Those who have to leave can leave. Michael, get up here. Sorry. I'm arguing with myself. While he's getting ready, I want to read this. This is called Security. There once was a limpet puffed with pride who said to the ribald sea, It isn't I who cling to the rock, it's the rock who clings to me. It's the silly old rock who hugs me tight because he loves me so. And though I struggle with all my might, he will not let me go. Then said the sea who hates the rock that defines him night, defies him night and day, You want to be free? Well, leave it to me. I'll help you to get away. I know such a beautiful silver beach where blissfully you may bide. Shove off tonight when the moon is bright, and I'll swing you there on my tide. I'd like to go, said the limpet low, but what's a silver beach? It's sand, said the sea, bright baby rocks, and you shall be lord of each. Righto, said the limpet, life allures, and I rover I would be. So greatly bold, she slacked her hold and launched on the laughing sea. But when she got to the gelid deep, where the waters swish and swing. She began to know with a sense of woe that a limpet's lot is meant to cling. But she couldn't cling to a jellyfish or clutch at a wastrel weed. I don't even know what some of these words are. So she raised a cry as the waves went by, but the waves refused to heed. Then when she came to the glaucous deep where the congers coil and leer, the flesh in her shell began to creep and she shrank in utter fear. It was good to reach that silver beach that gleamed in the morning light where a shining band of silver sand looked up with a welcome bright, looked up with a smile that was full of guile, called up through the crystal blue, each one of us is a baby rock and we want to cling to you. Then the heart of the limpet leaped with joy for she hated the waters wide. So down she sank to the sandy bank that clung to her underside, that clung so close she couldn't breathe, so fierce she fought to be free, but the silver sand couldn't understand, while above her laughed the sea. Then to each wave that wimpled past, she cried in her woe and pain, Oh, take me back, let me rivet fast to my steadfast rock again. She cried till she roused a taxi crab who gladly gave her a ride, but I grieve to say in his crabby way, he insisted she sit inside. So if of the limpet breed ye be, so if of the limpet breed ye be, beware of life's brutal shock. Don't take the chance of the changing sea, but cling like hell to your rock, it says. Who's your rock? Christ is our rock. He's an amazing king. How good is he? What else are you clinging to? Cling to the Lord. Oh, he's so good. Let's sing this song together. Michael, it's yours. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling 